this guy. One more round. The party's getting gay. One more round. I'm feeling kind of gay. Let me stay for one more round. Just one more round. Sing a song. A loud song with a cheer. Any song is cutting to my ear. Amen. Let me stay for one more round. Just one more round. Hi, I'm Finest Chung. That was Auntie Ermgard from Hawaii. <laughs> One more round. It's a little bit early for drinking, <laughs> but anyway, it's a good Hawaiian humor. So I hope you're well. I hope you're bearing up through all the hardships. Um, first of all, again, we must always, I hope you do every morning, send prayers to all the courageous frontline workers, uh, those in healthcare, transit, farm, grocery, domestic, delivery workers, without whom we would never have our health or the things that we need. So we must also send prayers to them because a lot of them have very hard financial circumstances. That's why they're doing what they do. So we must never forget that, all right? Then thank you for paying for class and buying our videos. So today we're actually going to go back to 1972. But before that, last week, I wanted you to show pictures because you have to understand, you wouldn't be seeing me right now unless my son Jason knew how to do all of this, all right? And it just so happens that at this time in his life, he ended up, you know, staying with me in the apartment because otherwise we could never do this. I could never do this myself or have it look as good as it does. So anyway, I'm going to take you back um, because I wanted to show you some pictures of him. So, um, uh, you know, I, here we are roller skating in the park. And actually, just after this picture was taken, we started to go so quickly down the hill that he let go of me and he ended up <laughs> rolling over. <laughs> so he was a little bruised, but we had fun. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to show you some of these pictures first, okay? Um, so there, then I want, this is one of the all-time favorite photos, which was taken by his teacher at the Dalton School, Vivian Thurm. And it's really a wonderful study. And isn't it? I mean, you can see his, um, his stubbornness, <laughs> his determination in his eyes. And it's still there. Okay. So, a couple more. And um, then he went to the Collegiate School for Boys. And um, we dressed him up. Okay. First he went to Dalton, then he went to Collegiate. That's where JFK Jr. went. Very you know, exclusive private school, which cost a lot of money. But from that, he has retained close contact with some very good friends. Okay. And then I want you to see this photo, which was actually taken by a very good friend of ours. We would call him Quicksilver. He did a lot of fashion work. So we did this in Central Park. And uh, actually, I think we've been arguing before we took so he's Again, he looks, he looks a little sullen, doesn't he? <laughs> Okay, so we got that. And then, as you know, he went to Vassar College. Oh, I want to show you this because this is Jason. And that's my mom dancing with his grandma at her 80th birthday in Hawaii. And she was a very lovely woman, as you can see. You know, she was half, half Korean, half Scottish English. And then this, I want you to see, because also... Um, you know, he was captain of his baseball team. And um, see that form? You see that stretch? Right? <laughs> I mean, that is a classic launch. And that throwing back. So thank goodness, you know, because he's able to, to put up and take down. I don't know if you've seen that funny video he made um, where he has to put, put up everything and take it down again. And then this is his graduation at Vassar. And you notice something? He's, <laughs> he wore his baseball cap with a tassel on it. You know, it's always Jason. Jason is Jason. Um, and he's wearing a Miley Lay, um, which is a very special lay for special occasions, made of his, that his uh, grandma sent to him. All right, so 
you've done with these pictures of Jason, all right? And now we're going to go to 1972. And if you can recall, um, I quit dancing. Uh, I left the Harkness Ballet in 1969 and, uh, because I wanted to devote my life to Buddhism. And I had reached, attained all my dreams in ballet. I wore white tights. Michael Smuin, remember? Michael Smuin said, you'll never be a classical dancer. You're short, you're oriental, you're bow-legged. Well, I proved him wrong, right? So, but by that time, um, you know, the story is, is I was lying by the swimming pool in Monte Carlo because that's where we were in 68. And if you saw the picture of the red shoes, you know, that's where Vicky finally goes crazy and under pressure and she runs down the stairs in red shoes and she jumps off the balcony and she's killed by the train. So I'm lying at the swimming pool there. And by that time, I had converted 22 of the dancers in the Harkness Ballet. They were all Buddhists. And when I realized the changes in their life, I said, you know, it's great to go on stage and get applause. And people say, oh, you're wonderful, you know. But really, it's not going to change anyone's life. So I said, I have to. I have to stop dancing and devote myself to Buddhism. So what happened is I, I quit in 1969 uh, after our New York season, which I talked about, where we had great reviews. And then... Um, I had been working in an office for three years, from 1969 to 72. I was a personal secretary to a man named Myron Piker, who remained a lifelong friend, actually. And uh, he said, well, I'm closing the office, because um, actually he, was, he wasn't doing that much. And so I asked my Buddhist leader, I said, well, what should I do for a living? He said, well, why don't you teach ballet? And you have to understand that when I left ballet in 69. People never saw me again. I never went to the ballet. I never took a ballet class. I, I left. I left. And not only that, remember, I, I burned. I burned my films. I had of Eric Boone, of Lona Isaacson, all the pictures. I burned all my ballet books. I burned my history because I said, I have to know that I can be no one. I'm, I'm not a ballet dancer. I'm nobody. I'm nobody. And I have to prove that I can be happy as a Buddhist. And that's why I quit. And so I destroyed my past. Because that's me also. I'm either all or nothing, as you know. And I keep changing things all the time. So he said, well, teach ballet. So, you know, I gulped. And I, um, so I remember I met Wilson Morelli in California. And he had a studio downtown, New York, 6th Avenue and 14th Street. So I called Wilson. I said, Wilson, what do you think? Do you think I could teach ballet? He said, I said, sure, you know, okay, sure. So I went to look at the ballet class, you know, and I'm looking and saying, oh my goodness, what are they doing? What are they doing? You know, and then I'm trying to think, you know, what's the name, what's the, what's the name of that step? What is that called? You know, and be, you know why? For three years, I had completely become a Buddhist fanatic, a religious fanatic, and working in the office during the day and every night, Buddhist meetings, Converting people to Buddhism. Uh, well, we'll talk about the other what happened as a result of that too. But I, I never thought about ballet, you know. I was, and I was very happy. I was so happy being a religious fanatic, you know, trying to convert people to Buddhism. Because remember now, this was you know, 1969, 72. You know, about to go to the moon, JFK, you know, LSD, hippies, you know. Um, so we were very idealistic. And believing, uh, you know, in converting people to Buddhism, and as they change their life, and they, we, we say we get benefits, you get benefits. So that, I was so happy, and, and, and very happy to do that all the time. So here I am, looking at this ballet class, thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know anything, you know? So I had to run to the bookstore, and I didn't have much money. And I got all the ballet books I could about technique, because Wilson said, you know, I'll give you four weeks. I have to advertise. You're going to start teaching ballet in four weeks. So I mean, oh, you know. And so it's, it starts to come back. I had Eric Boone's book on ballet technique. And all that. And I called David Howard. Remember, we had been roommates together. And David was also a Buddhist. And I said, hey, David, help, you know. So he gave me some tips and made suggestions. And um, so... The first time I go to class, 1972, and I go up the stairs, it's very quiet. 
and there are four students. And I said, oh my goodness, how am I going to make a living? There are only four people. And one of them was Sally Silliman, who, um, I have to do it this way, who later danced in my chamber ballet USA. And she was a lovely dancer and, and she actually taught. And uh, we're friends to this day. We, we've stayed friends all these years. Um, so I'm, of course, you know, dismayed to say the least. So I go home and I, and I start chanting, you know, because I'm chanting, Nam Yohor and Gekyo. And I said, I have to chant up a room full of students. That's what I have to have, right? So by April 1972, chanting works. Among the, I am, the faces appear, uh, the first people were ready from the uh, Paul Taylor Company, Nicholas Gunn. Eventually, Paul Taylor himself came to class. Uh, Judy Weiss, no, who later became uh, known as the Queen of Toe Shoes in New York, and today she works at Grishko, New York. Um, Linda Kent and Hector Mercado of the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater, and William Forsythe, yes. That William Forsythe, you know, who also, after Balanchine, he changed the face of ballet, right? Became a radical choreographer. I mean, just absolutely brilliant. And at that time, he was um, traveling the country in a station wagon along with Sandra Balastracci. And we just hooked up again, didn't we, Sandra, uh, on Facebook. So, um, and Billy was doing a Don Q, you know, all those just, I think there were six dancers, and they, they toured the station wagon. And he was a great dancer. He could do everything, which is, of course, why he could become a great choreographer. Um, and even Beatrice Rodriguez of the Joffrey Ballet, Martine Van Hamel of ABT. So they all came to sniff me out, you know, who is this guy? And soon my classes were packed. Um, and at that time, because I, I, I lack confidence, everything was in three, four, you know, um, ba, ba, um, ba, you know, because I, mean, I couldn't think of doing anything else. I was concentrating so hard just trying to, to teach and make sure the exercises made sense and, and they liked what I was doing. So eventually I had a wonderful pianist there, Steve, and he said, you know, you can, you can teach the other tempi. You can do a 2-4, you can do a 4-4, four, four, you can do a tango. I said, oh, really? Because, you know, I, as again, you know, three years as a Buddhist fanatic, you know, on the streets at night converting people, I mean, ballet was gone out of my life. So I had to kind of rethink it, redo it. So by the spring of 1973, um, the, the, the studio became too small. There were just too many students. And um, so I couldn't have the room next door because it was already rented. So I had to look for a studio. I just, I had to leave Wilson. And so I ended up on West 72nd Street. I think it was then it was called the Royal Bakery between uh, Broadway and West End. And it was one of these brownstone buildings, which I think is like 24 feet wide and maybe 100 feet long. So we called it the landing field. So it was kind of a rectangular state uh, studio. So, and there, it's a bakery. <laughs> So while you're taking class, you're smelling, you know, all, all these wonderful smells. And of course, there are cockroaches. There are cockroaches all over the ceiling, you know, in my office. There were cockroaches everywhere because of the, the, the bakery. So remember that it was also called the landing field because it was like this. You know, people had to go this way. Everything was across the floor this way, all right? So there, by that time, uh, among the students were my first New York City ballet dancers were Christine Redpath who later danced with my company, and again, we're friends to this day. Um, in fact, we usually have a dinner twice a, twice a year. Uh, and Stephanie Saland, who if you look at, when I do the, the YouTube videos, I always point to that picture of Balanchine and the Balanchine plant. Well, that dancer in white is Stephanie Saland, who later became a wonderful, gorgeous ballerina at City Ballet, and she's doing Apollo. Uh, and then from ABT came Charles Ward, Clark Tippett, John Sawinski, uh, from the Elliott Phil Ballet came Larry Rosenberg, who now directs uh, Anaheim Ballet, uh, and Vicki Koenig. She has her company there. In fact, I went to teach for her there in California. And the most wonderful dancer you know, of the time was Chris, Christopher Gillis with the Paul Taylor. And of course, what happened in time is that Chuck Ward, Clark Tippett, Chris Gillis, they, they all died you know, of AIDS. And in my class with Jillian Lynn. 
Yes, Jillian Lynn, who choreographed Cats. And she brought John Curry. Do you remember him, the famous ice skater? So I had all these, these celebrities, you know. And then, um, you know, when David Howard would go out of town, Gelsey came to class. I even had Gelsey Kirkland, plus all the Harkness Ballet Dance. It was a second company. So, you know, I was becoming a diva teacher there. And uh, because I was a Buddhist, though, that allowed me, because you see, in, in our Buddhist group, we would often put on musical shows. And so we would teach these guys, we call them the Young Men's Division and the Young Women's Division, people who had no dance experience. But we could teach them how to dance. I mean, not, not ballet, but they could dance. And um, in working with people like that, that's one of the things we learned in Buddhism, is that you can do anything you want to do. You have potential. All you have to do is learn how to do it. So um, my teaching philosophy then, I felt very free. I didn't feel bound to the past. I wasn't going to be a traditional ballet teacher, you know, going by the book. Um, I was going to try to make my own, my own ideas, my own technique. And because in Buddhism, we say, you know, life is full of infinite possibilities and changes from moment to moment. The negative can be changed to positive. And I believe, of course, and I've experienced this to this day. And uh, once you learn, and in Buddhism, the, the law is very important. Um, so it's not that we tr try to make everyone the same, but we say these are the, the laws that govern behavior, principles of movement. And if you learn these laws and apply them to everything you do, then you will be your personal best. So we give them the law, and so that was, became my search. You know, what is the essence of ballet technique? What, what in the end do people have to learn, have to know? Okay, that's going to make the difference for them, to, to empower them, to give them that. Just a second, I have to get a sip of tea. So what I want to say also is that you know, we've been putting on shows now. We're in our 10th week of doing this, uh, six shows a week. Well, we're a little bit less this week. Um, but, you know, Jason eventually ended up working at Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball Productions, and that's where he got involved, got involved in video production. And in Buddhism, we have this word myoho. Well, we say no myoho, rengekyo. Myoho is like we say the mystic law, yeah? something mysterious. I mean, isn't it strange that this happens? So his experience in working at Major League Baseball, excuse me, uh, put him in touch with all these, these kids who knew how to do video work. Because today, now, Jason is able to set up, you know, the set, do the lighting. I mean, he does everything. He's doing all the production, he's doing the camera, and you know, all of that, and then taking it down. So without Jason, you wouldn't see this, any of this. But this is what he learned, because you know, also, as I said earlier in my bit of my biography, um, when I was nine years old in Hawaii, and I told my mom, I said, I'm gonna be a famous ballet dancer, I'm gonna go to New York and Hollywood, which was just crazy, you know, because we didn't have any money. We were so poor, you know, and, and nobody I knew dance ballet. So anyway, as Jason grew up, then I never stood in his way. You know, I always said, okay, you just go ahead, do, do it. Try it, do it, go your way. Because I felt he had to find himself. And now today, <coughs> everything we're doing is more of his own <coughs> self-discovery and learning this, these skills and um, <coughs> where he's going to end up doing good things for other people. So going back to teaching, I want to show you this photo also, because this is what my studio looked like uh, when I finally moved my large studio, which became the finest Chung Ballet studio on 77th and Broadway. It was 60 feet long and 40 feet wide, you know, like a theater, like a stage. You see, the, and it had those two big poles right in the middle, which is fine. And I want to show you this woman in the back, the tall woman, was at the time, her name was. What was it? What was her stage? She was in City Ballet, uh, Linda Homick. And today, she is Linda, Dr. Linda Hamilton. And you've probably read her books or read her articles in Dance Magazine. And she is a performance psychology specialist and wife of Dr. William Hamilton. 
Cat Slender. So she was one of my early students. Um, and it was funny uh, because in the beginning, this is before Marley, you know, um, I would have modern dancers like from the Paul Taylor Company. And oftentimes, you know, they, they wore socks and uh, they'd, they'd get pinpricks in their feet. You know, the pins would be coming out of the floor. I thought, isn't that strange? How could there be pins in the floor? So in 2006, I taught at the uh, Jackson competition and I met the daughter of Thalia Mara who had actually created the competition. Thalia Mara used to be in that loft and she used to make costumes. She, and those pins that went into people's feet were from Thalia Mara. They had been embedded in the floor and as people, you know, moved the floorboards, the pins would come up and poke them in the feet. So that mystery was solved how many years later? Almost 20 years later. So in other words, you see, all, all these things get resolved, even pins in your feet. So, going back to uh, teaching, uh, when David Howard was teaching us every morning, he began every morning, he would sit with his coffee, you know, after we did our chanting, and he had a notebook, and he would write down uh, the exercises. He did it every morning. He never thought of going to teach without first composing the class. So I remember that, and so I started making you know, because I'm different, color-coded index cards. I made recipes. So, you know, blue is adagio, and maybe pink is um, pirouettes, or green is, um, uh, we did the bar, we didn't do that. But I had for Petit Allegro, little jumps, big jumps, or beats. So I had all these color-coded cards. And eventually, I had a box, you know, a fire box, this long, filled with cards. You know, so in the morning I would, I would go like, like I would go through and say, okay, maybe today we'll do, we'll do this blue, we'll do this pink, we'll do this green, we'll do this orange. So I'd go to class with my, with my cards, and I gave the class according to the cards. So I didn't wing it, you know, I, I prepared. But what happened? Uh, the more I had, and you have to understand that that room you saw. Was he, would eventually become filled with over 60 dancers because at that time then, professional dancers, this is the late 70s, early 80s, through the 80s, there were only three diva professional teachers, David Howard, Maggie Black, and me. There was no Steps, there was no Willie Berman, we were the three dancers. So in my class, you would see dancers from Paul Taylor, uh, Martha Graham, City Ballet, ABT, um, all the major companies, right? And yeah, for the 10 o'clock class. So as I did each class, I remember I'd, I had studied with Willem Christensen, Madame Perry Slavic, Robert Joffrey, Madame Volkova, Stanley Williams, Eric Bloom. Rosella Hightower, David Hightower. So I remembered, I started to remember these different exercises they gave, you know, and tried to apply that logic. So most of all, though, I was teaching professionals, all right? So, and for many of them, they had performance. They had rehearsal all day and performance at night. So I tried to, to be considerate of them and give them classes that would really warm them up. So in time, you know, my classes came to be known as, you know, if you take finances class in the morning, you're ready for anything, all right? So, and as time passed, I started to get Broadway stars. Cheetah Rivera, Gwen Verdon, Sandy Duncan, as well as I said, all the leading dancers. Um, and here, here, I want to just show you this other view of the studio. So this is actually um, Matt Turney, who was a famous, let me get this adjusted. She was a famous Graham dancer and she's teaching floor exercise, which is based on the necklace technique. But look at the beautiful studio, isn't that nice? I mean, we don't really have studios like that, you know? Well, unless you're in a professional company. But anyway, so it was a pleasure. All right, so teaching in this huge studio, you know, and, and the windows open, and then we had a big fan, you know, for ventilation, uh, and the buses are going by, and the traffic, you know, because it was Broadway, it was Broadway. So eventually I, I became hoarse. 
and I had trouble speaking because I was trying to, you know, talk over the piano, over the music, and you know, so many people. And so I had to have a vocal cord polyps removed. And after I did that, I went to a speech pathologist, you know, to help me. So she said, well, stand in front of the mirror and look at yourself. You're talking like this. You're talking like this. You know, you don't have any breath, you know. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, really? I didn't, I never thought of that. So she trained me, you know, that you have to speak, you know, through the breath. And then, um, by 1979, I had my studio renovated. I had the floor replaced uh, and put on a Marley floor on top of it, you know. And I built a loft and uh, I put the piano up on the loft. So when you walked in the studio, um, the piano was up there. But so was I. <laughs> and by then, I became, I was like a vaudeville act, you know. I had a microphone. And then I had a stick, which you know, I used to beat out the rhythm, okay? And the mic had this long cord. So when people would come in the entrance to the studio, and they'd hear this voice, and they'd look up, and there I am, you know, above them. So they said, it's like the voice of God, you know? But it was wonderful because being up there, it's like when you go to the theater, you sit in the balcony, you can see, right, everything that's happening on the stage. So I had that bird's eye view of the entire studio, and I could see who's pulling on the bar, who's leaning off their leg, and with a microphone, I could give them the corrections. Plus, on the platform there, it was easy for me to demonstrate everything, you know. And in those days, I did everything full out, you know. I did on half to, I did promenade at my bar. It used to be a killer, many people. Some people, they, they came, they said, I can't, I can't do this, it's too hard. It's too hard, because they want the, you know, they want just a frou-frou kind of class. And I would make you do promenade by yourself on half toe. And I had some wonderful, like Elise Flagg from New York City Ballet. Um, she would wear point shoes. She would do the bar, you know, without using the bar. And she was, she was in point shoes. So, you know, there were wonderful dancers who really understood what I was trying to do and benefited from it. Um, so, anyway, going to the speech pathologist convinced me. I said, isn't that funny? The mirror is, I thought, I had no idea what I was doing until I looked in the mirror. I said, you know, I have to really use, of course I had mirrors, but I thought, I have to learn to use the mirror as a tool, and I want students to actually see what they are doing. So, you know, I would say, look at the mirror, your foot is sickle, and they say, oh my gosh, it is, you know? Your shoulder, look at your shoulder, you know, and it is. And look at your pelvis, look at your hips. They are tilted, aren't they? Well, okay, so I learned, and then what I would do as a positive thing is I would say, when you pirouette, I want you to look in the mirror, and you see your preparation, and then I want you to focus on your eyes, because you're going to do plie, spot, and you're going to see yourself, bing, you're going to be in perfect balance, you're going to finish your pirouette on balance. So you're going to look for yourself, that's in your mind, you're com programming, we didn't have computers then. You're programming your computer, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to fall. I am going to balance. So that idea then again of using the mirror, which I now today, I do, I have everything facing the mirror, I said, you look at yourself, and I want you to see, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you actually see now that you reached the end of the plie? Because you know, after that I revolutionized my, my teaching methods. So that happened. Um, and then, here's a, this is a view of the studio. I have to get used to trying to do this. Okay, is that right? No. It's so hard, I have to show this to two cameras. Anyway, there I am in my finest young t-shirt, and you see there's Sally Sullivan, and you can see Mark Spradling, the tall guy, who eventually went on uh, to San Francisco Valley, and he danced with, he danced with Billy Forsythe. Um, but that, that's an example of the kind of um, things we do. In fact, we, I do this today. I do this today, right? That big stretch, bending your back. So I met all kinds of pianists, right? Um, so first it was Rodney Hazen, who unfortunately not today has passed away. But he was wonderful, very sensitive, very sensitive. And one day in the rain, he comes in carrying this, 
this piece of paper that's all dirty. He says, look what I found. Look what I found. And he puts it up on the piano, and he starts to read it, and he plays it, and it's most beautiful music. And it was a, uh, a piece that w had been composed by Mrs. H. H. A. Beach. I never heard of her. So he goes to the library and Xeroxes the comp We had to Xerox then, right? And he plays it in class, and it's beautiful. So, you know, there was just wonderful little incidents like that, you know. And then another pianist was Philip Leland, uh, who at that time was the world's, one of the most experienced pianists. He reads everything he plays. Uh, Rodney read some, but also improvised, right? Um, but the thing about Philip Leland, he was, again, a very nice man. But, um, and now we're talking about 70s. We're going to go, I'm, I'm kind of in, floating in and out of the, the late 70s and through the 80s. <clears throat> so Philip comes in one day, very upset. And he says, I've just seen my doctor. And he said, I'm going to die. You know, and I, I mean, I'd never had anyone tell me that. And he says, I'm very sick. But he didn't look sick to me. But of course, eventually, he was the first person that I knew who eventually developed full-blown AIDS and died. And then one day, this big, tall guy walks in. It's Bill Brown from Arkansas. And he walks into the studio looking for work. So I say, OK, we'll go up there. And, and so I just show him and I play. And he's just improvising. And it's the most mellow, full-sounded music. I don't know if you've heard, um, because we, we made a recording, um, which of course sold a lot of vinyl, right? And then later on, I did make um, uh, a videotape, uh, music tape of it. But he was one of a kind, Bill Brown. And um, you know, all I had to do was kind of indicate the exercise, and then he'd just start playing. And he'd watch it because he was up there, so he'd watch all the dancers. So it was such a perfect match, you know, with Bill Brown up there and playing the. We had, I had a grand piano, and no mistakes, but just so simple but beautiful but different. You know, that became also one of my uh, identifications that I I used pianos to play different kinds of music. Um, and then another fabulous pianist was Benjamin Bradham. Very slight in build and beautiful. He's still playing to these days, Ben Bradham. Wonderful piano. And, uh, and he improvises, improvises, okay? So here, I'm going to show you, is eventually I became, uh, I think this, this man might have been already 82. In the 80. Anyway, the photo uh, was put in uh, Connoisseur. There was a magazine called Connoisseur magazine. And uh, an article was written about me called Perfect Teacher. So, um, 1982, well, let me show you this picture also. Um, uh, this is me doing a pirouette. And it's so hard to find. I'm looking at two cameras, you know. That's all. And actually, uh, about six or eight of those dancers, they're, they're part of my chamber ballet USA. Because, of course, I had to go on and make my own ballet company, right? Like I didn't have enough problems. Um, but anyway, those were really, that whole period from the beginning in 1972, Morelli Studios, then to 72nd Street. Oh, for a while also, actually, I taught in the, in the Steps building, you know. Uh, Maggie Black had taught in a little teeny studio um, above Ferry Grocery. Grocery. So I was there for a while too. Then I made my own studio, the famous, finest young studio on Broadway, 77th Street, that uh, so many people remember. In fact, so many people, you know, yesterday was our birthday. You know, I'm 83 today. Do I look older? Um, and Jason became 44 the day before. And it's so strange because, uh, you know, through Facebook, so many people now from that time, from 77th Street, they're all coming back <laughs> into my life. You know, they're fine. And also through the, the, the shows we're doing. Um, anyway, the second floor, people like it. It's bigger, it's better. <clears throat> and that time, also, I have a staff, uh, Leanne Plain, who had been a former soloist with uh, Mary ABT and Alicia Alonso. And she was in the original cast of West Side Story and Redhead. Um, 
Sally Solomon is teaching. Barbara Forbes, we're still good friends. In very, in very, I just, she just emailed me today. She's been teaching at Sarah Lawrence, and she's a Feldenkrais expert. So you want to investigate Feldenkrais? You look at Barbara Forbes. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry to cough in here. So um, yoga is taught by Eric Beeler, and also Eric too. Eric and Bill eventually became sick with AIDS. Um, and, and died. So this is also 1982 when Cats opens on Broadway, choreographed by Jillian Lynn. You know, so she gives me and my wife tickets to opening night, and of course, it's the first time we ever see a show like Cats, you know, with all of that, the scenery, and, and so it's, you know, you're just dazzled by the spectacle. And the, the lead, one of the lead characters is Mr. Mephistopheles, who does the turns in second. And at the time, the original was, um, excuse me again, Timothy Scott, a young kid. And he had been a regular. Also, I had, I had almost all the Cats dancers. They came to my 4.30 class because it was their warm-up before the show. And Jillian told them all to come and take my class. So I had the Cats people, you know, all of them. I had uh, the original, the first cast of uh, La Cage Fall. So I had all these um, really, you know, wonderful, strong, handsome young men, right? And then Timothy Scott comes to me one day with tears in his eyes, and he says, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, and I'm just thinking, oh my God, no. You're so young, you're so talented, you know, and this was the beginning. So one by one, you know, these boys, because I had so many men in my class, they start to get thin, they start to cough, and they have this look in their eyes. They're frightened, you know. They're frightened. They know they're going to die. So to recall, you know, all those people, including Bill Brown, uh, my pianist, but all these talented, you know, young performers, gone, you know, gone, one by one, was such a, a tragedy, you know, um, that's imprinted in my mind. And uh, I think but all of those things <coughs> have further motivated me to try to really be a good teacher and serve people well. So, in the midst of all of this, in 1981, I decide I'm going to form my own ballet company, Chamber Ballet USA, which ends up costing me $100,000 at the time, which is $200,000 today. But it results in two happy marriages, which survive to this day. Um, I'm going to show you a picture. So I'm going to be seeking into uh, Chamber Ballet USA as well. Okay, if I can do this. And this was one of the first pieces we did. And you're going to see that's Naomi Sorkin, the first group of dancers that I had. Because first we had to get a group together, <coughs> excuse me, to put on a showcase to raise money, all right? And that's David Loring, and that's Carlos, that's Sally Silliman, that's Juan Gautreau. Um, and they're actually performing Je, which by which is by Tour Van Schaik. Um, so any from 1981 to 1986, you know, and here I am, a successful teacher, and um, my good friends say, you don't want to do this. You don't want to get involved in trying to make your own company. You're a good teacher. Stay happy. But you know me. I mean, it's never enough. And the reason is because, for instance, I saw a Paul Taylor company where he had was Polaris, where he had six dancers. I said, look at that, you know, six dancers, that's enough, right? So I said, okay, why don't I make a chamber company? And this was also the time when the National Endowment for the Arts <coughs> was funding companies, you know. I mean, America was in a good state at the time. So I said, okay, we can do it because we should have a little company of professional dancers that can go and tour, you know, and in all these places and colleges where people don't get a chance to see <clears throat> good dancers. So that was a motivation, you know. Not that I wanted to be a choreographer. God knows that because at the time I was, I was still married and uh, 
you know, raising Jason. Um, but I'm going to save the rest because this is Chamber Valley USA is really a whole story in itself. But the thing that I want to talk about is that what I learned a lot from not dancing and being a Buddhist fanatic was that when you work with these people who work in offices, they're not, they're not dancers, they're, <clears throat> they're not even athletes, but you can give them things to do, movements to do, that make them look graceful and that are entertaining and have energy. So I felt free to start to develop different kinds of, excuse me, ways to start the class which were not traditional. Instead of just going directly to the bar, we'd stand away from the bar and start to do different kinds. You know, I started to experiment with uh, standing stretches, floor stretches, and then um, different sequences of exercises at the bar. But also, I was starting to <clears throat> use the mirror. So I would pretty much give you know, a very strong, very athletic class that's going to, as I say, prepare these dancers, so they're not going to get injured and be able to rehearse. So that freedom I got from being a Buddhist allowed me to eventually develop, you know, the finest Jung Valley technique, which if you've taken class with me or if you've seen my videos, I mean, all these different ideas continued to grow and develop as I went on through the years. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave you with this um, conclusion, though, is that, this is what, again, what we say is myoho, that I had to quit ballet in order to find ballet, you know? I had to quit ballet and become a Buddhist fanatic so that I could become the teacher that I am today. Um, and that has given me the value, you know, to help you. So, um, we're going to close. Uh, and if you enjoyed this program, I hope you'll consider making a donation towards funding future programming <laughs> because we've had to buy a lot of new equipment. If you'd like to support us, you can do so at finestjung.com slash live. And you want to remember that because I, you're going to be referring to that uh, this weekend. <clears throat> we are very excited to announce that starting next week, we will be teaching four different live online Zoom classes which require advanced registration and payment at my website, okay? So it's going to be a little bit different. So for the classes I'm going to be teaching each week, they're going to be live online Zoom, and they're only for that duration. So you register for the class, you pay for it, and you take it, and then it's gone. It's done. Um, we will also be, however, live online with a free dance class, because I know for some of you, you're really strapped financially. And uh, also the next Friday. Friday, so we're going to continue, because there's still more to go through my life story. Um, but all week, starting on Monday morning, you will have access to a pre-recorded ballet class on YouTube, right? So you should know that, that it's always there. Whenever you want to see it, as many times as you want to see it, it's going to be there. So I want you to check my social media in the next couple of days for more information. Or better than that, subscribe to my email list, which is at the bottom of all my website pages. Because if you do, then you'll always be kept abreast of the changes. Because I said, these Zoom classes, you have to register ahead of time. You can't just, just come that day. Okay? So... I want you to be ahead of yourself here, okay? So, um, this weekend, you can continue to enjoy free, previous recorded classes on YouTube. And the links are available at finestchung.com slash live. So, and also remember, my instructional videos, they're still selling at half price. I guess they're never going to go up again. <laughs> the world has changed. Streaming videos only at finestchung.com. DVDs only at Amazon. So, please, Keep your brain in your head, right? Think before you act. I want you to stay safe, no matter what you hear, right? It's your life. You only have one life to live and to lose. So don't lose it. Be careful. I'll see you later. Thank you. Before the party starts.
That's why I 